story to hook you? Mm. Yeah, I was in the first two paragraphs. <laughs> and then they went and talked about the others. I'm going, oh, great, I'm above the fold in the Boston Globe. Um, the Boston Public Library is never going to let me in again. Okay. Um, I, I do have a good side of the story, however, is that last, last summer I went to look to see how they were doing, and um, it's closed for renovation and re-inventory. I was very glad to see this. It's well overdue. They have an amazing, amazing collection. But the fact that we found those documents through a card catalog, uh, we tried to find provenance for them. You know, And the only thing was, well, it has a really low number. Uh, so it's probably early. We have no idea how we got them. <laughs> I just keep looking over here. And you just go, oh. Yeah. Um, and, and they really didn't make any effort to find out how they happened to have these four documents. But um, I'm really glad to see that they are you know, currently close to all in-person public service. Yes, major construction project, and they're they're really go they're really doing the right thing by their collection. And um, I wouldn't have told you all that horrible story if I didn't have a good ending for it. Um, I still don't think the Boston Public Library is ever going to let me inside ever again. <laughs> so, um, other books that we have of transcriptions uh, have errors. So this is a page from uh, Woodward's volume, uh, he went and, and we don't know if he did it or he just was the, the organizer of it. They're, the Woodward's historical series have a lot of, there's several books of all sorts of things, of historical records. But this is a page um, from one of it, and it's the uh, interrogation of Tichuba. And here we go. At one point, Tichuba said, two rats, a red rat and a black rat. You know, who are these things that they seen? So she says that. Well. That's been controversial over the years. Um, there are other things to say is cats. Rats, cats. And actually, I've seen, I've seen people writing about it and they say, well, Tichuba saw rats and cats because they couldn't quite figure it out. And say, this looks like rats, you know? But um, this is what the document looks like. This is a really bad version of it, but you can see here, rat and rat. You would think that's rat, correct? Mm. It looks like rat, okay. Well, we go over to this other one that wasn't available in um, uh, Woodward's time. This is a different person. The other one um, was written by, now it's escaping me, Ezekiel Cheever. And this one was written by Jonathan Corwin. And if you zoom in here to what he said, I saw two cats. You can definitely, that's a C on cats. Two T's on cats. The spelling can be a little bit. But um, then you've got, uh, who did, and you can see here, two cats. You can see it a couple of times. So we have cats and rats, two people who are in the same room taking down the same examination. Now, one of the things is one of them could have heard rats and the other heard cats, and it just sort of, they're similar enough. Maybe that's the reason. Well, if we go back and look at this, rat or cat, let's see if we can disambiguate them. So we have some other things, the other pieces from that, and I said, the devil rained to me? Uh -huh. Yeah. The Ryle? The Rildren? No. That's the way he makes a C. Uh -huh. That's the way he made a C. They didn't hear it differently. It's just that there were quirks of how people wrote. Um, that you know, unless you're actually going to get in there and, and try and figure out how that person writes, you can't get it correct. But that whole that whole thing from Woodward. Woodward published in the 19th century, then the WPA transcribers um, in, in the Depression era, they took a lot of those transcriptions and just didn't go back and do them again, they just copied them. And then you get to the 1970s when Boyer and Nussenbaum put together that three volume set of transcriptions, well they just copied a lot of those, they didn't go back to the manuscripts. So all these additional sets of transcriptions have Ezekiel Cheever's thing saying rats. Now, the, the other one, the, the one you saw in black and white, again, that's another one, can you see it in microfilm, um, is at the New York Public Library. So that really was a new document um, that people hadn't collected before. So we didn't have that for comparison to say, what was it, rats or cats? So we wouldn't necessarily have gone to look for whether this was a problem in the Ezekiel Cheever one. Um, also, I had some other things. Uh, on the top, this is a piece of, um, Deposition again, so does it say which one should be? Uh, I think it's George Jacobs. Does it, do you see that in there? Mm -hmm. 
Oh yes, look at that. I have it right here. Thomas Putnam, Deposition Against George Jenkins. I really should read my own notes. Um, oh, I took my little, I took my little glasses off. Anyway, so on this one, also on the, uh, that's always been put down as 15th of May. And that was in the transcriptions. As a matter of fact, my, my Scandinavian linguist friends put it down as 15th of May. But I'm working from thinking, I've got the calendar. And I'm going, well, the 15th of May was a Sunday. There's no way they did any of that because they're too busy going to church. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have done any interrogations on a Sunday. So I actually had to convince them that they were wrong. But it was pretty easy because I found this other piece. Somebody is 45 years old. And that's a really clear five. Mm -hmm. And if you look at 1692, that's a really curvy one. But that's unambiguously his one. So I, anytime we found something like that, you really had to make a case with all your documentation. So this is, this is taken for something that I just I sent them. And I said, <coughs> It's the 11th, not the 15th. Um, so things got passed down over the years in transcriptions, and people didn't necessarily go back. So as I said, there are some errors in Woodward's book from the 19th century that got populated into the future. If you ever see anybody that has a list of the people who are accused in, in Salem, and it said there's um, Gerson Toothaker, you go, oh, yeah, Gerson Toothaker. I, uh, I got a C in college in the one history class I took on medieval history, and I happened to come across a list of people who were accused of witchcraft at my old professor's website. Mm -hmm. And Gerson Toothaker was in the middle of it, and I went, yes! I did write to him um, and tell him that I had learned a little bit about history, and he really needed to take that one out. <laughs> <laughs> but you will see Gerson Toothaker appear in lots of places. That's because in the Woodward edition, they were saying, oh, cases of, and here's Gerson Toothaker. I've never heard of the first name Gerson, but there are a lot of first names from colonial times that I've never heard of. Um, so Gerson Toothaker, it turns out, one document about Mary Ierson and Mary Toothaker. Now, in those days, the capital I and capital J were actually created the exact same way. You had to look from context to know whether it was an I or a J. And somehow, in Woodward's thing, they decided it was a J. Even if you read the text, it was all about Mary Toothaker and Mary Ierson. They put Gerson Toothaker. Because on the back, it had, you know, had both of their last names. So somehow, Gerson Toothaker became a person. <laughs> and then it got copied and copied. And even, it's even in Boyer and Nissenbaum's three-volume set. Because they have it set by case. So there's a case for Gerson Toothaker with one document. <laughs> about Mary Toothaker and Mary Ayers. So those are the kinds of things we had to clean up. Anders Robinson did a great job and put it in one of his books. But if you don't know, if you're just reading these transcriptions, you don't know. So that kind of stuff can really cause problems. And that's the other reason why we wanted to get it right um, and eliminate Gerson Toothaker. I was so proud to <coughs> back to my college professor. He said, OK. <laughs> ah, let's go back to my transcript. He's going to have to be. So, um, let's look at some other things. One of the things that we did while we were um, going through the documents is, as I said, we were looking at the actual handwriting. And if you think people's handwriting today is bad, oh my goodness. Um, teasing through these things was really a challenge, but we started being able to tell them apart. So, I made a database. And this one is Robert Pike, who was one of the assistants. Um, and so I put nice little bits of them so we could look through and see if we could match things. Uh, the numbers you see on the left, ECCA um, 1, 179, those are the original things that we were working from. Essex County Court Archives, Volume 1, number 179. Um, so you can see all these different things. So we could just sort of flip through and see if we find anything that, that looked like it matched. We also came up with different things we were looking at. Um, for this, I credit Monte Piccola. Um, so orthography, if they consistently spelled something a, a, a way, like she with two E's, um, they with an A instead of an E. So things that just were consistent. For instance, Thomas Putnam couldn't spell the word which. He spelled it W-I-T, no, W-I-C-T-H. W, w -I -C -T -H. 
So that, you know, if, if somebody gives me something, that, a transcription of something, and I see Wick in there, I go, Thomas Putnam. <laughs> um, so we're keeping track of their orthographies, isn't that a nice, uh, <laughs> nice word? Letter forms, and that's usually how people tell. Do they make their letters the same way? Do the letters match? And capital letters, or did I say majuscule? Oh, that was probably majuscule. Yeah, majuscule. Scandinavian language. Um, and I got into it, too. Um, but usually, capital letters are pretty easy to match, because people do them with a little bit of flair. But we are also looking for lowercase things and special forms and things that people did regularly just in writing their letters. We also looked at punctuation. That may not seem like um, something you would think about, but they didn't punctuate the way we do. There's one guy, he used colons. A lot. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Samuel Willard. No, Samuel. Um, which one Willard was it? Ah, Simon Willard. Simon Willard. I don't know how he decided to put his, his colons in. Sometimes you put colon after a colon. Um, you know, a couple of words, there's a colon. One word, colon. Three words, colon. Another colon. It was everywhere. Um, and that's one way we could tell that it was Simon Willard. You see, you should give me a transcription that's full of colons. That's Simon Willard. Um, so we were looking at stuff like that. They didn't use um, apostrophes for abbreviations. So you didn't see apostrophes. You saw a lot of um, maybe a period, maybe not. You didn't see many question marks. Um, but sometimes blank spaces indicate thematic shifts corresponding to new paragraphs. We had all sorts of things. Um, use parentheses a lot. But they didn't punctuate the way we're used to punctuate. So you could look at these features and say, ah, I know who this is, or this helps me to identify them. Abbreviations, oh my. Um, as I said, they didn't use apostrophes, so I won't write don't, but um, they used a lot of different things. Most, most people know about superscript, you know. Um, so, but for an abbreviation, actually that Y, the superscript E, the Y isn't a Y. It's a whole different letter altogether. It's called form. Yeah. And so it really was the. It was just sort of a fast way of writing th. Um, so it's not ye old uh, candy yeah. shoppy, um, but it's the. It really is. But we don't, we don't usually use form um, because we're in the 21st century. Um, but if you see somebody use form or not, did they use um, superscript? What are some of the other things? So which, w, c, h, um, that. Thorn with a T. All sorts of little quick ways to write these things. Um, also, if you had double letters, if you write the word common, think of how many m -m -m -m. they would write an M and write a line over it, called a macron. So you knew that there were going to be two. Yeah. So I mean, we don't use that. We could probably use it today. There are certain words that just kind of like everything blends together. But they use things like that to indicate. Um, they're different kinds of, of abbreviations. They also abbreviate a lot of things that we don't usually use in, in common language today, like a hogshead of something, you know, all these, all these different um, quantity words that we don't use today. We had to tease those all out. Um, so these were how we started noticing things so that we could try and identify somebody. So, and then what we did was, using new hand data, th these are just screen caps from, from the database that I had. So all those um, Essex County Court archives documents, and here we have the summons for witnesses, hand, that's hand two, as they go through the documents, this is the second hand that appeared, um, and then the amount, that was kind of helpful because if you only had a little bit, I used a few of those, but if you had like four or five, that meant it was really a lot. Well, here, um, whoops, didn't have it, sorry. I don't have an extra piece on that. Um, so if you only had a couple of words, you weren't going to go to that one to disambiguate a problem. But you were looking for one that has lot, lots of possibilities to help you. So we kept track of that. And then uh, the editor, which editor had done that. So we, 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 this is our way of just sort of going through all these documents. But once you start identifying somebody's hand in one document and you can see all the rest of them, you can start seeing patterns. So for instance, um, this particular Robert Pike, you see Susanna Martin, Susanna Martin, Susanna Martin. So this is somebody who's really involved in Susanna Martin's case, which I thought was pretty cool to find out. Um, we also see some stuff with Mary Bradbury. So clearly this is somebody who's out toward Amesbury and, and Salisbury. 
But we know who he is, so yes, he was in that area. Um, for people we didn't know, it would give us a little more indication of where they were from. But we didn't identify everybody. We had over 200 different um, hands um, in the data. At various times we called it hand, we call it, oh, handwriting, recorders, oh yes, we had recorders, mm -hmm. scribes. We went through all these different words for it and finally landed on recorders and hands. Um, we kept track of each of the recorders, or hands, or scribes, um, this way. So we have a list of the Robert Pike, that's the, the third one down. So here are their names. Um, is this somebody that we decided we had a name for? And you'll see some other unidentified scribe D. Um, and we had some other ones. Unidentified scribe deposition, because that was one of the things about the spelling. Um, unidentified scribe J. Oh, and number four, unidentified scribe W. One of these days, I'm going to figure out who he was. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason we call him scribe W, and notice it's lowercase, the other one's a scribe. No, his lowercase U's looked like W's. And sometimes when people transcribe his stuff, they put in a W. And it's not, no, that was his lowercase u. Um, so I really want to know who that was. And he said, you know, some notes. This hand appears on many of the grand jury of inquest um, oaths. So that's how we found him. Um, we then have a few samples of things, but we didn't have a name for him. So but we just kept track of all of these. So there are over 200 different hands that we kept track of, of course, through these. Um, we we're also looking at the features. This is sort of raw data from the, the database. So each time we had a sample of something, if we say that the capital B, and if you know HTML, that's how my HTML coding, capital B had a hook. Um, and then we had the sample and where the sample came from. So we kept track of those things. Um, as I said, we, we had comments on all these things, an overview, what does the handwriting look like? and orthography. So we had samples, visual samples of all these things for the spelling, the letter forms, punctuations, and abbreviations so that we could look at it. We didn't have the time to give it all the attention it needed. Um, the reason that Mati Painter and I were doing our um, archive hopping was we really hoped that we could flesh this out more. Um, but it didn't come to pass. And um, so it's sort of still out there. I have this database. Um, <coughs> we also kept track of whose hands, recorders, whatever, were in any given document. So if you look at that first one, um, we'd say Eka, 1001. You can see that um, there were three different scribes in there, same in the second one. And all those codes just go to another table of who's in there. Um, and also we had a degree of certainty um, to see if we had anything, whether it was a signature. Um, so we were just keeping track per document. Um, and this is what relational databases let you do. Um, so, and then the size of it, this is how we decided if we had a good sample or not. Um, and sometimes if they were really small, it was a little iffy as to whether we could identify it or not. Um, when it came to the book, we had parameters for whether we were going to include the information or not. So if it was somebody we knew, um, identification certainty, um, whether we were going to include it or not, you know, we just made decisions as we went along and could set all the parameters for any individual scribe. Um, so the result of all this work gives us this. Um, on the right, you have a page from, um, from our book. This is the first one. It's the warrant for the branch of Sarah Good. And so this is what it looks like on the left, and that's what it looks like on the right. Um, some of the stuff you see says reverse. So we have done things that are on the back of it. Um, and again, if everything starts off with hand one. That was a big discussion whether we were going to do that on every one. So I said, well, it's always going to be hand one. I said, yeah, I'd like to start it off and actually say this is hand one. So they get a little fussy at different times because we keep putting in where the different hands come from. Um, this one was really interesting. That last line over there says mark much for hand three. It turned out to be Samuel Paris. The minister, because even though it was just a little teeny bit of text, we got to know the handwriting so well that we could even pick out a little teeny thing, and that's a weird, weird thing that he, his handwriting appears there. He was already involved very early on in these proceedings, and we know it. We know it because of that. Um, what else did I got here? Oh yeah, here's the back, and on the back, 
Um, that's I brought the person, Sarah Good, the wife of, and the, the sheriff would add these things, this saying, I have completed what I've been ordered to do. Um, so we, we were looking at everything that was on every single document. The other thing we did was we kept track of the dates. Not all documents had dates. This one was nice because it said on this day, on that day. Um, but we would go through every one. So for that one, we had a date of February 29th for when the arrest warrant was issued, and then it came back on March 1st. So this is part of the database interface. So we could say what kind of a document it was, and we had like, I don't know how many different possibilities because that determined how it would get sorted out um, and how we were going to call the title. So this one had two dates. It's not like writing your letter home from camp. Different dates, different people. So if we look at this one, this was an evidence, evidence used at three times. And it doesn't really look like that, but we've got this. This is probably May 18th, what happened on May 18th or earlier. Um, this is, oh, scribe button. Um, on June 3rd, and that is dated. And then this last piece, um, jura and curia, meant that it was used at the trial. The trial was August 4th. So this is one document that gives us three different pieces of information for our database. And when we're sorting things, we want to keep well, we have two different dates. We have everything was on March, uh, on February 29th. Yes, I'll leave here. Um, and everything on March 1st, well, how do you organize all of that? So we were very careful to make sure that we could keep things um, together, the pieces would be together. Another thing about it, about that document is, and you'll probably see it, it's a great screen. Um, there are two parts to that, same handwriting, but they're different color ink. Um, and what we finally decided, and we found this on like 17 different documents written by this guy, Thomas Putnam, that he had ink changes in the middle of these depositions that he wrote. And it, that stuff after this is always about the day of the person's examination. It looks like it was added later. And the indictments, get this, the crimes that they were indicted for occurred when they were being interrogated. <laughs> and this, yeah, yeah, because everybody saw, everybody saw the girls screaming that they were being afflicted by specters and nobody else can see them, but the, there were witnesses to these girls' afflictions. So this kind of thing looked like it was added specifically for the grand jury to make sure they had evidence that would support the indictments. We wouldn't have known about this except that Dick Trask, Bernie, and I were sitting in the Phillips Library and um, I had pictures from all, all these other documents from other places and we were starting to wonder about this. And I said, well, let me flip up the ones we've got from the Mass Historical Society. And these things we found, as I said, about 17 documents spread across several archives that had this same ink change and started also on such today being the day of his or her examination. So that really gave us a little more insight into what was happening with the creation of these documents. And it's only because we went and looked at the actual documents that we even noticed this happening. Um, I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually had one document that had five dates associated with it. Um, as, as a database builder, I was trying to go farther than I think we'll go, so I'd set up for six. But this is the examination of Ann Foster from here in, um, in Andover. And when she was examined, July 15th, this, that's when all of the accusations started in Andover. This is the beginning of it. Martha Carrier had already been arrested because, well, didn't Carrier bring smallpox to Andover? So she was sort of like, well, did we miss anybody? But when they started going after Ann Foster, this is when it started unraveling here in Andover. And they brought her in July 15th, July 16th, 18th, 21st, September 10th. The 10th is, is when um, she was being processed for the indictment. But they kept going back at her and asking more questions and bringing in her daughter and bringing in her granddaughter. So when she was being interrogated, it was over several days. And you can see that this just kept going. And then whoosh, um, all sorts of people were being named and interrogated. But this is the pivot point that brought these trials here to Andover. Um, we looked at all sorts of different ways that pieces of documents were used. So these are all, kind of, it, it, it went on for a lot because we wanted to keep things together, whether somebody um, 
just an officer's return on a death warrant was different from an officer's return on a minimus or things like that because they had to go together. Just designing how these were, pieces would go together. Um, that was my challenge on, on the end. And Bernie, every once in a while, would say, I knew what I was doing when I asked you to be my project manager. I said, no, you didn't, because I didn't know how to do this stuff then. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, I learned a lot about coding and databases. Because it, it turns out that's the way my mind works, and suddenly I had tools to do it. Um, one of the things that this give, all this data could give us is access to patterns of participation. So um, I've used this, um, this graphic in some of my other talks. Um, so this is our basic timeline. The pink is when the 